This is uh, something I've been procrastinating on doing for a year. So I just want to welcome everybody. And, and I'm super excited to be here with Dr. Janet Faulianto, my, my old professor, um, who in many ways, if I had never met her, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. So I think this is the perfect time and the perfect person to, to start this conversation with. And we're going to be talking about all things work related, small business related, uh, in pursuit of achieving the American dream. And something very dear to me is, is, is chasing that American dream for me has been a business owner, right? And I think there's no other country in the world where, where we can fulfill that. And we have this limitless potential to attain our goals. Um, and one thing on the road to to following that American dream that just has has really stuck with me is just this one word, and, and it's, it's called the process. For me, one thing I've seen, and I feel wholeheartedly about it, is that we have lost sight of the process. And you just give you a little feedback on what I mean by the process is the process is 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 getting in there. It's getting dirty. it's it's putting in the ninety hour work weeks to achieve your dreams. And all too often now, we're just focused on the end result, the goal. We want everything instantaneously. And the more instantaneous and goal-oriented we become, the less process-oriented we become. And you cannot be great at anything if you're not willing to walk through the mud. If you're not willing to just, you know, there's no other way to describe it. You just sometimes just need to eat shit. And I come from the, the I am the son of an immigrant. My dad came to this country uh, when he was 21 years old. He spoke no English. He was the oldest child of, I think, eight or nine children. Um, my dad has a fourth grade education. In fourth grade, he he had to he had to leave school so that he could put food on the fam on the table for his family uh, and help his father support his family. And the reason I give you this context is because it, it's 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 made me who I am today. So by my dad being who he is is, is in part making me who I am. But more so, he's taught me my work ethic. Um, and to be a man who did not have an education, who came to this country, eventually brought all his siblings over, who built a life for himself, who, who put in the work, he, he walked through the mud, he ate that shit, and he built a life for himself outside of, far outside of what he could have ever imagined growing up in a two-bedroom house in a not-so-great area of Puerto Rico 75 years ago. Um, and I want to share that story with you. I want to share my story with you. And, and we're going to talk about it in depth here with Janet is, is, is falling in love with that process all over again and, and getting dirty. And, and when you dig into that process, that's where the happiness comes from. That's where the success comes from. And you know, I want to turn it over to Janet really quick right now. And just, Janet, we've talked about process. Right. And something I thought about in doing this with you is, right, we're, we're talking about the process. Mm -hmm. And we both could be doing other things. We could be, I don't know, drinking coffee outside, reading a book. But no, we're here. We, we've committed to something. Mm -hmm. And we said we're going to go through this process. And I, mm -hmm. and I thought about that today is we're not in love with that. We're not in it anymore like we used to be. We're just worried about the goal. Mm -hmm. And as we've moved away from falling in love with that process and become so goal-oriented, we're losing the meaning of our work. Mm -hmm. And I know that's something that you're super passionate about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a couple of things that I wanted to say to that is that um, we, we're training people to not be in the process. So one of the, the teaching ideas that I talk about is process versus product. So process is when you come in and that you forget about where it's going because you don't know where it's going and that's what you're describing. And it's so interesting to hear you talk about your father because he modeled for you how to be in the world and then you created that model and you're doing the same thing that your father did. Um, and it's really, it's really wonderful to hear you speak like that and to see that it started from him. Um, and because I had the vision of knowing where you came from and then meeting you when you were that kid at 19 years old and now as that man 20 years later. So it's a really interesting vantage point that I have, right? So the whole idea of process versus product and the process is to come in with something, be open and receptive to whatever it is and let go of where it's going. And product is when you come in aiming at the end before you've even started anything before you've engaged with anything so that you know you, you come in thinking like okay I'm going to run the place or you, I'm going to make a million dollars but there's no engagement with being brought into the endeavor of whatever the endeavor might be right so and that's a that's a big deal those two different mentalities are really important and I think that in this culture we're trained and people are told have the goals, have this, have the directive. 
And I don't think that's beneficial at all. And, and if people really lived by that of having the goals and striving for the excellence, don't you think we'd see a lot better in terms of outcomes of people? We don't. So it's just, it's nonsense. It's not working. It's, it's not working. So I think we have to change it up. And so that any time that you come in to something, focusing on where it's going, you kill it. That's what I say with the students. And that could be a business. That could be a relationship, right? You start a relationship. And if you immediately start to think, is this heading toward marriage? You're probably going to kill the relationship because you're not moving into the relationship and just evolving and seeing where it goes naturally. You're sort of taking it to its conclusion prematurely, right? So, and this mentality can apply to anything, coming into a class with the focus on getting out of the class, coming into school with the focus on getting out of the school. Um, I, I think it also plays on tests, you know, that a test, a focus on the grade. The focus on the grade typically is going to mess you up. The point is that you learn the material and then you do well on the test as the byproduct for having learned the material, right? And the point is, is that the learning should then be with you for a lifetime. You don't forget it after the test is over, which is if you're product driven, you take the test and there goes the material, sure. right? So again, there might be some um, dovetailing here also with Frankel is one of the things that Frankel says in the book is don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. So it's exactly this process versus product is this idea of aiming over here and keeping your sights over here. You're not going to get there. And, and that's the whole point is that if, if you're not in it, if you're not knee deep in it, right? right. If you're not willing to pay the dues or I like to say, right. you're not willing to pay rent, right? I call it rent. Um, you got to pay up and you got to be in love with that nitty gritty process. It's not beautiful. You know, and there's a, there's a great story I love. Um, Kobe Bryant, I love sports analogies and sports work ethic crossing over to the business plane. I feel like they, they do uh, parallel each other in a lot of ways. And Kobe Bryant's in the gym. The lights are off and it's just him in there. Nobody can see him. And at that moment, he's already won that night's game. Because nobody, he's the greatest player on earth at that time, right? He's on his way to winning his fifth championship. He does not need to be in the gym right then, right? I'm sure there's a million other things someone of his stature could be doing. He's got more money than he can spend. He's the, one of the greatest yeah. athletes to ever walk the face of the earth. He's in a gym by himself at 5 a.m. Yeah. shooting hoops. Mm -hmm. Now he knows the opposing team mm -hmm. is going to walk into the gym at 8 a.m and start their warm-ups. Mm -hmm. He's in their gym. He's away. I believe it was in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And he, he, another player comes up and says, hey, what's up, Kobe? How long have you been here? I've been here since 5 a.m. Oh, you're just getting here at 8 o'clock in the morning? He's already three hours in. He's already taken a 1,000 jump shots. And he goes, ah, it's cool, man. I'll see you later tonight. He's like, yeah, you might as well not bother showing up because you're going to lose. And the guy goes, doesn't get it. And what he doesn't get is the process already started for Kobe to win that game. And they wound up demolishing him that night. But he had defeated his, his opponent because he was willing to commit to that process. Mm -hmm. And along the way, from a young child up until he becomes one of the greatest basketball players to ever play the game, he was always in love with the process. And, and there's another player right now, Steph Curry. And Steph Curry's thing was his dad was a pro player. And he had the ability and, and really the, the, it was a gift. He was able to be around professional athletes with his dad from a very young age. But a lot of kids would not have taken that opportunity the same way Steph Curry did and turned into what would be one of the greatest now mm -hmm. pure shooters the game has ever seen. Mm -hmm. And people think he has a gift to be that. There is no gift. Yes, he's a talented basketball player, but talent is, in my opinion, the most overrated thing in the world right now because talent doesn't get you anything. What he is is the hardest worker who had a good shot. And Steph was notorious for asking people to stay and catch free throws for him. So every day from when he was in high school, he would not leave the gym until he swooshed, meaning the ball could not even touch the rim, which is five times in a row. Thanks for telling me what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Swoosh, it's perfect. It's the perfect free throw. He's the best free throw shooter in the game. Not by chance, but by work ethic. He put in work when nobody was around. Nobody knew who he was. As a matter of fact, nobody wanted to draft him because he wasn't the biggest. He wasn't the best quote unquote player. Well, now what? You know, he's winning championships left and right and is arguably one of the top five players in the game. And people say they almost diminish his accomplishments by saying he's a natural. Yeah. He's, he's gifted. 
bullshit. Yeah. There's no natural gift in there. That was someone who fell in love with the process, who committed to it for yeah. their life, and now you're seeing that on a public forum. Yeah. What people aren't saying, though, is he's 25 and 26 now. What about from age 22 to 10 when we go back? Mm -hmm. 12 years he put in, nobody knew who he was back then. And that's mm -hmm. what made the person he is now. Mm -hmm. And I think this relates to everything, right? For me, I feel blessed personally to come from the son, as the son of an immigrant, right? I feel like it, I'm a little cheated because I'm not an immigrant myself, right? I, I'm one removed from that. I feel two removed from that's even worse if you're number two down the line. But I feel it's a gift to be the child of an immigrant because what they taught us is that nothing comes easy and you have to put the work in. And they modeled that behavior for mm -hmm. us. And I know speaking not just of myself, but people who've immigrated to this country that I know, and, and they just have a different perspective on work because to them it's a gift to be able to do the work, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I know it's something we, we spoke about and I thought about it today on my way here. I just moved into a, a building in New York City and everyone I interacted with today was not from this country. And I said, what, what? and they all took pride in their job. The man who, who opened the door, the who worked in the building. Dino opened the door for me. Hey, Mr. Vasquez, please don't call me that. It's Anthony. You're right. uh, the, the, the man who, who got the packages at the desk, he's from Croatia. The person who came to fix something in my room, he was Latin. Not one born in this country. They all take such pride in their job because for them, it's such a gift to be able to even have this job mm -hmm. that would not be afforded them in their, their, in their country of origin. Mm -hmm. And ironically, it creates the best juxtaposition in the world because it's a job most Americans never want to do. Right? Mm -hmm. How privileged am I to have somebody open the door for me? I can open it myself, but I live in a building where they do it. It's crazy. And I can't even wrap my head around that. And I always make sure I say thank you to them because I feel like the job they do and, and, I, and I appreciate the pride they take in the job they do. Because you could very easily just walk through opening a door for somebody and not know how many names this guy knows. What a gift. He knows every time I see him, Dino knows every building tenant's name and their dog's names. Mm -hmm. That's a gift. Mm -hmm. And that comes with work. And that comes with falling in love with the process and being appreciative that the process is even available to you. Mm -hmm. Well, and then we have to have a conversation about the war on immigrants that we have within this country, which we don't appreciate what they have and we don't appreciate the fact that they're willing to do the jobs that Americans don't want to do and um, and that we as an economy need these people. It's really, really interesting what's happening within this culture and uh, the demonization of immigrants instead of the celebration of immigrants. But a couple of things of what you thought, what you were talking about is that um, Within that quote that I, I offered about Frankel about don't aim at success, he says, success comes as a result of dedication and commitment. And you've been speaking about those words. So that in, in this country, the only, the only idea of success now is money and that it is nothing else. There is, well, we don't even have any other value besides money. That's what I say, that, that money is important, but it's eclipsed all of our other um, values, that that's all we have. So like students now coming up say, I want to make a lot of money. One is, that's not the way you make money. You make money finding something that you're drawn to, that you can do well, that people are then going to pay you to do, right? So that you, you find your place within the world. But there, there seems to be this schism right now where people don't understand that. I want to make a lot of money. How are you going to make the money? How's that going to come, right? So there, there's the idea of it's extreme product thinking because it's money disconnected from anything else, which is just odd. And, and I wonder, like, why don't you hear how odd that is, right? And like the, the athletes that you talked about, that they don't need to make any more money. You know, these people who create these these high tech companies, and then they grow them, and then they sell them for you know a gazillion dollars of whatever happens, right? And then what do they do after they sell the business, right? Do they and the students say, oh, you know, they they go and left, left, buy an island somewhere? No, they don't. They create another business because that's their purpose. That's why they're living. The money is the byproduct from living from a place of your purpose. They don't go and live on an island. I mean, one of the guys who invented um, a company, it was three of them, they sold it for more money than they ever will need. He was a student at Stanford at the time. He stayed a student at Stanford. He didn't drop out of school because now he made a fortune. 
is that he'll go on and he'll invent other businesses and he'll sell them and then he'll invent other businesses because that's where he is supposed to be, right? So within the structure that we live in, one is the idea of process versus product, that we're so focused on the end result, we have no appreciation for engaging with that, with coming into something. And the other perspective is that work, we, we never, ever talk to, to people about work. We talk to people about jobs, and I'm going to talk in my talk about that. Work comes from the Latin opus, meaning something grand you produce with your life. It has to do with your purpose, right? It has to do with finding this, whatever this area is, is that's where you are supposed to be. And then you stay and you groom yourself and you learn and you grow with that. And, and it's, everybody's is different. Um, like I used to work in investment banking before I returned back to academia. And I knew I had to leave because it wasn't my work. And I knew I couldn't continue to do it because I felt dead there. However, there were other people who lived for it. They lived for putting together the deal. And that was their purpose. And they were there before anybody came there in the morning. And they stayed before everybody, after everybody left at night because that's what their purpose is. So I think that we're, we're missing this piece. I think the whole idea of, of work and how much work can feed us and how much work can give to us, but we don't live in that kind of mentality anymore. We don't have that head anymore. And, and I do think that, as you say, these ideas can be generated and put into any context in any application. So. Um, I had a student who was running a, a drug-mandated clinic um, by the courts. That, that was his job. And he took all of these ideas that I'm teaching, and he taught them within that setting. And he said, you know, like, somebody calls, and they just got the directive that they have to enter the program, right, as part of their condition. And they ask, how long is the program? When do I get out? And he says, wrong question. Because if you come in with that mentality most likely you're going to be right back here in a couple of months later on, right? You're not going to engage with the program, which is to transform you. And you're just seeing it as something tick. I go through, this court is making me do this. How quickly can I get out? You are sabotaging your success in the program. And if you really listen to people, you see it right from the start. You hear it right from the beginning, right? So one of the other ideas that I teach my students is, your approach is your response, right? So how you come into something is typically what you get back. And so if you, if you come in with the mentality is, I'm gonna give this my all, I'm gonna do whatever it takes, I'm gonna see where it develops, you gotta, you gotta think that good things are gonna come from that kind of mentality, which is, and the opposite mentality is, I'm not gonna do that, that's beneath me. But it's almost like now, we're talking about Process, purpose, there's another great P word, participation, right? So we don't get an award in life for showing up, in my opinion, right? But now we've done this thing in schools where you get participation awards. Uh, you get an award for just showing up, especially in, in, in athletics. And to me, that sets the groundwork for what this is, which is people now are not in love with the process and they think they should just get paid or become rich or be the next Mark Zuckerberg just because they should, not because they've come up with a brilliant idea or they've struggled through this process in building something that they that they're part of right they just want the participation award which i hate i think they should be i think participation award should be banned it's first second third place there's a score there's a finite way to judge athletics per se and i think a lot of that lays the fundamental groundwork for who you become as an adult it teaches you to compete it teaches you to win it teaches you to lose I was just talking to a school teacher and they said the, uh, the fire department came into the school and they did a fundraising, uh, a fundraising event for the fire department. And the, the class who raised the most money got an award. I was like, what a great idea. So you have eight classes. Everyone's competing. You have a very finite way to look at it. One through eight. One class raises the most. One class raises the least. The class who raises the most gets a pizza party paid for by the fire department. Well, a mother in the class who finished second thought it was a disgrace that her child would not be rewarded for finishing in second place. And, and I immediately thought to myself, could you imagine if we went to the Olympics and we said, 
my child got silver. He really did deserve gold, but he got silver. We, I need to protest this. They would laugh them off the stage. But now what have we taught this child? You can finish second and mommy and daddy will bail you out. Now what's gonna happen when they go to a job and they wanna apply at Google and they're the, they finish second in the testing? Is the mom gonna call up the vice president of Google who may have interviewed them and said, hey, um, my child, he got pizza when he was in third grade because he finished in second. I'm hoping you can, you know, I don't know, give him a raise now, even though he didn't do the job he was supposed to do. But we're building that into the framework of how we're developing children, right? So we've fallen away from the process, but now you're getting a participation award just for showing up. Mm -hmm. But here's the other thing is the incongruity and the paradox of what we tell kids of having the goals, right? So there's the disconnect of... We're pushing goals, goals, goals. Be driven. Be driven. We, we tell them all these platitudes and all these maximums. You know, you know. You go into a school and you see these on the do on the walls. They drive me crazy. You know, shoot for the stars because shoot for the moon because then you if you fail you land, land amongst the stars, stars, right? Well, if you really believe that, right? That that would transform the this whole school. But there's a paradox, right? Because we're telling them that. And then we're telling them you, it doesn't really matter because everybody's going to be a winner anyway, right? But, so but that's where I think the, the, the brilliance in that should be. Shoot for the moon and you may land upon your face. When you land upon your face, learn the lesson that that landing caused you because now that's where you're going to grow from. There's nothing wrong with failing. Fail and learn. Failing just to fail, failing just to make a mistake and not getting something from it, that's a, that's a shame to me. I've fallen on my face numerous times. If it weren't for those lessons... And having a good support system and having sometimes people say, you know, suck it up. Just suck it up. Get over yeah. it and keep moving. Yeah. But the lesson is there. And if you don't make the mistake, if you're not allowed to fall or fail, right, you're not going to land amongst the stars. No, you're going to fall flat on your face on concrete. You may yeah. lose everything you have. That's yeah. part of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a couple of, there's one thing that I wanted to bring into this conversation, which is, um, and it, it's very difficult to even have this conversation without thinking about the college entrance scandal that's going on right now, which is essentially what you're describing, which is mommy, mommy wanted her poopsie in this school, so she made that happen. And it was a complete fabrication and uh, a, push, a complete distortion of who the kid is, right? But this whole idea of, um, and, and from my experience as a mother of looking at this too, is that this whole idea of fairness is that everybody gets the same thing. And I have a child with disability, and fairness is not that everybody gets the same thing. It, fairness is that everybody gets what he or she is entitled to, right? So that within the context of your scheme, that everybody gets a participation award is that not everybody is entitled to a participation award, right? But maybe the, maybe the competition has to be tweaked a little bit because there are people who have disability, who are not at the same level of the other kids. So how can we take this competition and then take into account the fact that for some other kids, it's difficult, right, in terms of generating the money to win the competition or performing athletically. They need a little bit of assistance. They need, they need the sport to be adapted to them because it's not a level playing field, right? But, when, but more often than not, we're not doing that adaptation that we need to be doing to plan for children's success. success. We're just flattening everything, you know, and that's not any remedy. That's not a good place to be in terms of what we're doing to kids. So um, I do see in traveling around, some parents think that um, if your kid gets something that my kid doesn't get, that that is an extreme injustice. Why is that an injustice? Your kid doesn't require an adaptation. Your kid doesn't require the extra time or whatever. So. I mean, this is the distorted world in which we live that even with this college scandal situation that we've been seeing unfold with, you know, parents getting their kids into all of these colleges is that some of them manufactured that their kids had a disability. So they got extended uh, time, they got adapted environments, 
they when the kid doesn't have a disability. Well, the only person they're robbing is their child. I know. And that's the shame in it is because now you've set this up. I mean, and, and the amazing part is, you know, some of these kids got into really good schools. I know. I'm wondering how far does it go? Because if you can't get into the school, how do you handle the workload at the school? Well, a lot of them, is, well, not a lot. <laughs> I don't know a lot because I can't even bear to listen to any of them talk because they don't have anything to say. And so how do you as a parent allow your kid to take a microphone and have 2 million viewers and essentially has no message to deliver? That, you know, this is, where have you dropped out as a parent in terms of, just you and I had a conversation earlier about professors and the responsibility that we have to our students. And we all have a responsibility to the next generation. And is that really serving the next generation when I do that for them? Um, and then one of the daughters in that whole scandal too is saying she, she didn't want to go to school. She wanted to continue her work that she was doing with being a spokesperson for these companies. And that was not good enough for the mother. So the mother manufactured all of this, this, these ways to get the kid into school, and the kid isn't even attending school. So it's, it's again, a, in an a environment of meaninglessness that what are we doing? What are we creating? Who, who are we serving? How is it benefiting anybody? Because it's really not benefiting anyone. So we look at that and we say, oh, yeah, you know, they cheated the system, and I think you accurately say, cheated the kid. Cheated the kid. The system, I mean, I feel worse for the kids because you've now set these kids up in life. What are you going to do when they go get a job? You turn around and you're going to call their boss up and say, hey, can I make a donation? I mean, you know, I feel like you, it goes down the road in just a really crazy way. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't want to speak about the elephant in the table, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, you, you, you know, it could have far-reaching ramifications, right, in terms of, um, it, it, it doesn't matter. You can get far in your life by doing that and playing the system and being a fraud and having, you know, your parents push you along because they have money and they'll open things for you. But you, you had brought up something. You said, you said that the, um, we're talking about, people not falling in love with the work, not falling in love with the process, and that they, they just want the end goal, right? Right. I interviewed a kid maybe like two months ago. So he comes in, and he goes, I'm like, I have a job assisting. It's not great pay, right? Um, but within that is the process of you being able to learn what we do, which mm -hmm. if your goal is to become a professional photographer, which is what I do. Well, guess right. what? It's a good deal. Right. You're going to get paid to go to school in essence. Right. Right? We're going to school you on how we do this. And you're inherently going to become better at what you do. So the guy comes and goes, you know, I want to make, um, we're, I'm like, we're offering A. He goes, I want to make Z in pay. I'm like, man, that, that I, you know, I want to make $10 million a year right now. And he looks at me like I'm crazy. And I said, bro, you're in a different world right now. I'm like, there's a process, you know, and you need to uh, sign on that this might be a multi-year process. He's like, well, I just want to be where you are. I'm like, how old are you? He said, I'm 23. So I'm 38. So in order for you to be where I am, you still have 15 years, right? So we got to start there. I said, number two is I've been doing this since I was 16 years old. I'm 22 years in on this. You can't, we can't compare. We're apples and oranges here. You're three months in. You can't even take a picture yet. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying it because you need to check your ego at the door mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you need mm -hmm. to really have some self-reflection as to where you are right now. Yeah. And I said, you know, I said to him, I said, man, I said, mm -hmm. I, I want to be honest with you. That's the equivalent of me saying I want to be Michael Jordan. I'm seven inches too short. I don't jump that high. And I'm really not good at basketball. But I love Michael Jordan as a kid. That doesn't mean I get to go be him. Right. I idolized him. I thought he was great. But I had enough se sense of myself to know I wasn't very good at basketball. I can't dunk. I'm never going to be him. And theoretically, I'd be the shortest person in the NBA. Like it just, there, there are limitations. And it gets back to, yeah, I believe we are all should be treated equally, but we're not all equal. Yeah. I'm not Michael and he's not me. Yeah. And, but we all have this fascination that we can be. And I said, dude, you can be me, but let's start with talking about how much you're going to need to work. I'm like, I haven't taken a weekend off that I had the possibility to in 17 years. I learned that from my dad. I only saw my dad on birthdays every seventh year because that's the day it fell on a day he had off. So there was never like, oh, dad's, no, my dad's going to see you on his birthday if he happens to be off. There's not, I'm going to take off because it's your birthday. 
immigrants don't do that. Like that's just, there's not like, oh, it's Tony's birthday today. We're going to have cake. Not like he woke up at three o'clock and then went to work and he said, happy birthday and threw me 20 bucks. Like it was a good day, you know, but mm-hmm. that, that is just not reality. Mm-hmm. And I feel like right now we have this perverse sense of reality. Mm-hmm. It's not how I grew up. Mm-hmm. You know, I saw my dad when I saw him, it's when he had off. I saw him every seventh Christmas, every seventh New Year's because he had work. And he had to work because he had to put food on the table. And I see these kids and I'm like, dude, you are so disconnected from where reality is and what it takes to get to be here. You don't just pick up a camera and become the owner of of a studio and, 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 and handle the work we do. There was a process to get here. And sometimes the process sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, there's hiring, firing, dealing with 30 employees, the overhead, the headache, the dealing with customers sometimes, all that can become daunting. But that's who's made, that is what has made me who I am today. Right. And if it weren't for all those obstacles, right. the, you know, again, Ryan Holiday, The Obstacle is the Way. I wanted to give him that book. And then Ryan Holiday's other book, The Ego is the Enemy. You have way too much ego and you're not willing to deal with the obstacle. And I feel like that's a problem a lot of people are faced with today. They have an overinflated sense of self-worth yeah. without the willingness to tackle what the obstacles that are in front of them are going to be. Yeah. And see, here's, and I would be interested to hear how did the younger person respond to you telling him that? Deer in headlights. <laughs> so, <yeah>. Crickets. Crickets. <laughs> yeah. um, see, this is, this is the whole idea also, and the word I wrote down when I was listening to you talk was equality, right? He sees himself as equal to you. And maybe we've created that maybe we have been too informal maybe the whole idea is everybody is equal within this culture and that we don't have um any sense of authentic authority anymore like you know that from a parent from a teacher from a person who's more experienced from a person who's older no authentic authority everybody is equal it's a flat you know field um, and then, you, you know, you were talking about the over um, manifestation of the sense of, of self, self-worth. But I think also the other paradox is this, the, in, the over exaggeration of self-worth, but really underneath it is not a strong sense of self at all. There's no sense of self. Yeah. But there's the vision of grandeur and it's not there yeah but it's 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 fake it's not it's not based on anything that's real it's 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 a disconnect like i see you know i see it in young people too that i talk to is that they you know watch tv shows and they think oh yeah i'm going to become a doctor because i watch a tv show about doctors is that there's such a, a a real fundamental disconnect and it sounds to me it's so practical you know it's such a obvious thing or they'll say something like i'm going to become an accountant but that they're flunking out of math and they still think that they're going to become an accountant um it's it's this world of mythology that we've constructed that and the word mythology is greek it means it's a telling it's not true or it's not false but we tell ourselves like anything is possible anything can happen to you in this world in which we live like the whole the circle back right to the beginning of your talk the american dream which is everything has potentiality anything is possible but what doesn't get said is with dedication with hard work with sacrifice with knowing about oneself which what knowing what do you have to contribute to an area that people will be willing to pay you for Um, So all of that stuff gets left out and all we say is, you know, this is the land in which you can create anything. Well, not without all of those other aspects too. So it's only part of the story, you know, the American dream. And, And we don't hear, we don't hear from people, you know, like your father and like other immigrants who have, who are able to tell their story and then for people to understand that and then understand the sacrifice, dedication, commitment, all of those things. Um, and, but this is the whole thing, right? You only see, like you said with the athlete, you only see where the person is right now and you don't see where the person was to get to where 
And again, that's process. You don't see where the person was to get to where the person is now. And that's why one of my favorite books is, is The War of Art. Right? And people are always confused for The Art of War with Sun Tzu, but The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. And he, he's an author, and he talks about, um, he's a New York Times bestseller, but in, in The War of Art, he talks about how in order to be a master of a craft, no matter what your craft is, there's a rule. The rule is you have to apply 10,000 hours to that craft. He goes, and if you average that out over the course of, um, you know, however many years, you know, it takes years to become a master. Whatever, whatever craft you're going to decide to do, you have to invest the 10,000 hours. And ultimately, he writes a bunch of different books who go nowhere until he comes to The Legend of Bagger Vance, which becomes a film. And that's his first book that takes off. And he winds up running a bunch of others that become New York Times bestsellers. But he talks about the process was The Legend of Bagger Vance was not that book. It was the process of the 10 books that failed that nobody ever cared to read that he went through and it, it, later in life finally wrote that New York Times bestseller. But that bestseller is the culmination of an entire lifetime of work. People only now see him yeah. of Gates of Fire, of Legend of Bagger Vance. They don't see the other 15 books that nobody ever even took the dust off of to read because he couldn't get them published. But all his books he talks about was overcoming the resistance, overcoming the voice that told him to quit a million times, falling in love with the process, which the process for him was sitting in a cabin in California by himself, and some days he'd sit at the computer and nothing, in the computer typewriter, I should say, mm -hmm. and nothing would come out. And that was part of the process as well, right. because he knew he had to sit there right. for the time that all of a sudden something would click and words would come out and flow. Right. And, and that process of having nothing flow to having something flow to having a New York Times bestseller is completely directly related to each other. And the more we shy away from putting in the dirty work, which is sitting in front of that typewriter for 10 hours and not a word coming out, we lose... We, we, that's how a masterpiece is created. That's how greatness in any field, whether it's sports, writing, academia, you have to be willing to put the work in. And you're right. We're only looking at the final outcome, where the person is now in the present, not what it took to get them to where they are. And a thousand percent look at Instagram. I think that it's notorious and really has shaped our, our culture around this is everything is so fast, so instantaneous. How many likes am I getting? And all you're seeing is the end result. You're not seeing any part of the suck right. that went into where they went and right. what they had to get through. Right. And you, you don't see any of that. And I just listened to an interview on Joe Rogan and, and uh, Kamara Usman won the 170-pound welterweight, uh, first person from Nigeria. And he had him on. And you know, they're talking briefly about what it took for him to get here was that he was born in Nigeria in a, in a town with no running water, an outhouse, barefoot, eight years old. When he came to America, he got sneakers and went to school. The school he was taught out in Nigeria was by his aunt and his uncle, and they would go get uh, switches and beat his hands if he got a wrong answer on a test. And he came here and it was like running water, bathrooms, and he was freaked out. But fundamentally laid the groundwork for him to become the champion of the world was in the process of everything he went through to become that person. And he's an immigrant. And he barely spoke English. They spoke pidgin English in Nigeria. So he had to basically learn a whole new language. That's, that to me is the beauty of his story, is that nobody sees the kid who didn't have underwear and didn't have shoes and whose parents couldn't put a meal on the table. They only see is, is mm -hmm. the end result is him holding up that belt, not mm -hmm. the 31 years behind that and the mm -hmm. immense amount of work and all the pain he went through to get to where he is. Mm -hmm. and, but I think this is where the power of stories come. And that's why I said your story, your father's story, his story. And that, because we don't have a cultural construct, which has, you and I have talked about this before. We don't have a cultural construct of apprenticeship. We don't have that anymore, right? Whereas, you know, cer certain other cultures have that. America, we don't have that anymore. So how are you going to understand process is through people's individual stories and listening to people's stories and the importance of people speaking their stories. And just in talking to you, I, I remembered and appreciated that in my process is that I, when I'm going through my PhD process, is that you come to a certain point in the program where you have to take your comprehensive exam. So you start studying for your comprehensive exam and it's five questions. You go, you, you show up every day one person on your committee gives you a question, you go into a room, you write a paper, you turn it in at the end of the day. You do that for a week. 
you have five questions that you answer in the week, and then you have your oral defense of your comprehensive exam. Well, in the, in the leading up to the studying for the comprehensive exam, I realized I know this much about my discipline. I don't know very much about my discipline. So, well, why don't I try to master this little bit that I know and try to really understand it? So I started to break it all down, right? And I started to map it out. Okay, there's this idea, this idea, this grew into this idea. So that I, let me let me di let me dissect it so that I could put it back together in some kind of synthesis that makes sense to me. Okay? So then I went through the exam, and you know, you spend X amount of months studying before you go through the exam. Went through the exam only to discover that the whole purpose of the exam is in that process. And I would not have known it if I didn't go through it. And then in retrospect, I look back and I see, oh, now I get it. The whole purpose of that exam was to engage with that process the, the exam was just the end, the end, and it was sort of already done, as you said before. It was, the game was already won before the game began. I had already passed the exam by engaging with the process, and I didn't know that until I went through the exam. And it's probably fair to say the process was not the most fun. Um, it was tough. I mean, I remember reading books, and I felt like the words were just like running over me, like I got to... I gotta try to make sense of this. It was a lot of work and it was, and I remember it very clearly, but this is the other thing and the message to tell also the next generation. You don't understand where all of this stuff is going while you're going through it. Like I'm sure you didn't understand it when you were going through no. it either, right? And so that's the, the writer and I would say written works that I have done also is like, wow, this work was the foundation of every piece of work that I've ever done since. I had no idea until I stopped and have retrospect and I look back. That was the beginning of my entire process. So this is the thing too is you don't know what something means while you're having the experience. It's only when you get beyond the experience that you look back and then you can appreciate your process. And so this is what I think we have to tell young people because how are they supposed to know that? And they have so many things that are working to their disadvantage, right? And they have inflated egos and they, they think that by coming into an interview and saying, I want to be you, they think that that's the right thing to say. And they've read interview books that tell them that that's the right thing to say. Like, I want your job. No, that's not the right thing to say. And you, you know, if you take my job, I'd be unemployed. Well, it's, it's just, you know, you, you can't just do what the books tell you to do. You have to actually respond to the individual in, in front of you. And you can't make it into like a technique and do this and it's going to win for you. You know, we, we, we give them really bad advice. We really do. And so I, I, I always feel like I feel sorry for young people. And that's why I asked you, like, how did he respond? Because what you were doing and you were attempting to do was to teach him in the moment. And I wondered where the teaching went. Out the window. And that's, and I think it's, it's fine. It wasn't the right person for the right. And, and ultimately I'm willing to bet that he won't be doing this or anything in this capacity for a very long time based on just that brief interaction. Um, and I've, I feel like I've personally cultivated a good bullshit radar when it comes to people from interacting and interviewing so many people now for the past uh, 15 years, you get a good sense of people. And we were, we were talking about in my office, we had a, a young girl, um, she's 22 years old. She came to the United States uh, about 18, maybe 28, 20, you'll say two years ago. And she came to my office. I wasn't here. She left her resume under the door. To me, okay, cool, right? Nice try. Didn't even reply back. It was a random resume. Came back the week after. Now, I still wasn't here, but my video manager, Gabe, was in the office, right? She gave him his resume and said, I want to meet Anthony. I need a job. He said, well, here's his business card. You know, she waits three days. Crickets from me now, right? She sends me an email. Her email is in English and in Spanish, which I can appreciate because her English was very rough at the time. So she must have had somebody translated for her because it was written correctly. So I, I said, wow, that must have taken a really long time. 
mm-hmm. for you to actually now have somebody translate that into correct English. Mm-hmm. Now you have an, you're getting, your foot's in the door now, right? You've pounded the pavement enough where you're going to get the opportunity to walk in. Fast forward 16 months, she's doing all the back end production for us, all our retouching, everything. She has two things. One is an incredible work ethic. Two, she doesn't shy away from the process here. I'm like, hey, I need you to learn this. She goes home and studies YouTube videos. She doesn't come ask me how to do it. She uh-huh. figures that out on her own and then comes back in yeah. and does the job. Mm-hmm. And we were all talking about it. I said, that's work ethic. She, there's no bullshit. There's no frills in it. She's going home and working for free on her own time to right. become better at what she does here. Right. She will have a career in this should she choose to, whether she owns her own business down the line, whatever it is she decides to do in this. Because once she, if she applies that work ethic, that's work ethic that doesn't fail. You might fail momentarily, right. but as long as you have enough backbone to keep getting up when you fail that will ultimately lead to success Mm -hmm. because the process that she's going through is 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 in my opinion that's where it's at and if you're willing to do what you have to do for the short term the long term becomes a lot easier Mm -hmm. because while you're in it you may not realize but you're laying i see that now i see what she's doing is what i was doing at 23 years old right and now i can see if she sticks doing that well, now you can do whatever you want in this field, or I think in any field for that matter, if you apply those, those rules. And if you take the initiative, which is something that everyone wants to be handed things. Right? I can't tell you how many times people call me up, where are you located? And I go, what? Mm-hmm. And I'm like shocked by the question. And people go, why does that question irritate you so much? I'm like, we walk around with a computer in our hand that you, all you have to do is put the address in Google Maps and it comes up. So I find that to be a weird question when I don't ever ask people. But... To me, it just goes to show that inherent laziness, right? So, but for people who are looking to seek out that information, that to me is beautiful. Who are willing to engage the process, that's beautiful because that's where you have limitless possibilities. That's where an immigrant sees something that most people don't see. They see limitless possibilities. And right. this is the only country still to this day right. that you can have that in. Other countries, you can't do that. You right. can't just show up to other countries. I'm going to build an empire. I'm going to make I'm something gonna... of myself. You come here for that. And that and still in 2019, this is the only country that offers that to, to people, right? And now we've we've hated on that subclass, which to me yeah, is absolutely insane. Whereas, you know, I'll make the argument, you got kicked out all the immigrants tomorrow. I'll show you an economy and a country that falls flat on its face within 24 hours yeah. because there's no workforce. Right. And they're doing things. Right. Someone just made a beautiful point to me. And I, they said... We are so lucky. Did you go get a pedicure in the past three months? Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, think about that. Who works in most Mm -hmm. nail salons? Mm -hmm. Asian, you know, Korean, Chinese immigrants, right? Mm -hmm. And he goes, they touch our dirty feet and make them look nice. And they do it with pride because in their country, they have no opportunity. He, and I'm like, man, that's like, when you think about it in that context, they touch our feet, the the dirtiest part of our body, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways. And they do their job with pride. And yet we want to banish them all off. Show me somebody else who's going to do that job. Not just do it, but do it well and do it with, with a sense of purpose and meaning. And, yeah. I, you know, even go the Chinese restaurant by my house. Seven, there's a blizzard. They're there. No one speaks English. Kids work in the restaurant and they go to school too, right? After school, they come in and they work in the restaurant. They are always there seven days a week. Now, what I'm seeing is I see two parents in the back cooking food. I see their two children in the front of the register, and I see those two parents with a dream that they're going to send those kids to college, and those kids are never going to have to work in a Chinese restaurant again a day in their lives. And that, to me, is while we're hating on that subdivision right now, that's mm-hmm. really the beautiful story there. Mm-hmm. And, and I have to think that when I'm listening to these stories is that I'm, I'm not an immigrant, and I didn't have this mentality when I was younger. And, and maybe it was because I'm not a child of an immigrant. I mean, my family has been in this country more years than I can even keep track of. And I had to learn and I had to develop in this way as an adult. But all the kinds of things that you're describing with regard to kids and when they're coming in with, like I wasn't that, that young woman that you described with the, with the resume and writing it in two language. I wasn't there. Right. So that's why I feel like also we have to we have to teach the kids and we have to show the kids a better way. And we have failed in terms of teaching them where we have fallen asleep at the wheel in terms of us as the adults teaching the kids, because I know these things now. But now I'm an older person now. You know, it's way beyond me. But I was equally as clueless as all of these kids that you described. And that's why I'm asking, like, with regard to 
did the kid, did you feel like you got anything in and any made any headway with them? Because I, I feel sorry for them because I feel like they're really lost and, and we're not telling them these things and we're letting them just be on their Instagram, seeing a fabrication of a world, having a mentality that is not accurate in terms of the world, but where's the, where's the teaching coming from? And where are we as the adults taking the authority and saying, uh, listen, you know, don't, don't do that. That so, you know, this, when we look at the situation with regard to the colleges and what's happening with the kids is, I think it is, you know, the failure of parental authority and protecting the kid and doing right by the kid and serving the kid and directing the kid. But, you know, maybe in the world of equality, there is no authority, right? Is that, you know, everybody's friends and everybody's equal and I don't have any right to tell you, you know, don't do that. But I think it's, you also have to be comfortable with failing and people just don't want to fail or and from a parent standpoint, they don't want to let their children Very tough. fail. Very and, tough. And there's nothing wrong with letting your child fail as long as there's a lesson in that failure of, hey man, maybe you didn't do great today. But I think the, the personally, I think the moral needs to be, you only know this, the, the, the beholder only knows the answer to this. Did you give it everything you had? That's success. Did you leave everything on the field? Did you leave everything at the office that day? Did you give 100% to yourself in the classroom? Now, only you can answer that. Right. And John Wooden was famous for this. And that, that's how he coached and won eight, eight titles in a row. Great, greatest basketball coach, college basketball coach ever, would ask, did you give all of yourself today on the court? That's a question you can only ask yourself. And only you can be comfortable going to sleep tonight if you think you left something, that you, if you didn't give 100%. You played 99, well, you left 1% out. 1% could have been the difference between a win and a loss today. Right. And only you can answer that question. But then it's, again, also too, we have a fear of failure. Whereas I've learned more in my life from my screw-ups than I have from my successes. Far more. I've learned not to do them again. And when we take that away from people, children, whoever it may be, you are doing them a disservice because failure, I mean, think about how many times Steve Jobs failed or Thomas Edison before he created light bulb. Imagine we stopped him at failure number five. What was he in 3000 before he created one that turned on? I mean, it, it took years. It was life work and he wound up doing it. But what if we were like, hey man, you're failing way too much. You should really stop now. And if he did, I mean, that to me is insane. Or if somebody told Tesla, Elon Musk, how many times was he told, you can't do what you're gonna do. Millions, everyone, no one could believe that he could actually build a car company on electric cars and go to market and compete against people for a Chrysler. But if he would have listened to them and he, if he would have just stopped when he failed the first 50 times, well, we wouldn't have Tesla Motors today, a, a huge disruptor in the industry. He would have listened to those people. But he said, no, screw it. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do this anyway. But he learned from, obviously learned from his failures. Mm -hmm. As a mother, I have to say that it's very, very hard to watch your kid fail. Um, and it, it takes a thick skin to be able to do that. And it's, it's really, really hard in ways that you couldn't imagine if you're not a parent. And it takes a very wise parent to appreciate the meaning of a kid's failure. I had a student once who, who, who got the scholarship, went away to school, flunked out, everything failed, lost the scholarship, had to come back home. And the father said to the kid, um, you needed that failure. Now that's a really wise father. And the father who is going to take the financial hit, the father who is going to take the kid moving back home, all the consequences that are not the most convenient for the father. But see, that's what I mean about a father who's really being a father, you know, and who is really serving the kid and telling the kid, that's one, that's one student's father in 22 years. I've never heard any father speak like that. You needed that failure because you needed to learn the lesson that was entailed within that failure. Now that's impressive, but I, I don't think that's commonplace. I don't think that that's what we're doing oftentimes. No, and I mean, we want everyone to always win, I but know. if you're always winning, you're never failing. And I know. if you don't taste that, you, I also think it, it creates, we were talking about ego and this inf huge in inflation of, of self-worth that we have right now. And Brian Holiday gets into it really good in his book, Ego is the Enemy. We need that. Like we really inherently as human beings need to be humbled 
and we have these run-ups of success. We don't fail right now. And we're, 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 we're creating these bubbles around people or around children. And when we don't let them fail or we don't let them totally blow up in certain cases, you're not letting them grow. And the self-discovery happens not in your success. It happens in my, in my full belief. You learn 10,000 times more about who you are as a person, the fabric of your character, your moral being when you fall flat on your face. Because if you get back up, lesson learned. It's when you don't get back up, but we have to be willing to let them fall in order to see what's going to happen. Because if we pick them up, that's no good either. Sometimes people, you have to leave them well, on their own. Well, and this, this is the point, Anthony, with, and I've been talking a lot with you about having twins and one's typical child and one is a person with disability. And I cannot tell you how incredibly difficult it is to watch a kid with disability fall. And so I recognize that, and um, I don't want to watch him fall. And so I oftentimes say he is so much better off that I'm not around him every day because he's around people who expect of him, who push him, who um, make it a little bit uncomfortable for him, and he is better served. Those are the therapists. Those are all the people who are... Um, asking him even to use his communication device. His therapists are much more on that than am I. And so that I understand and I appreciate the desire of the mother is just to engulf and sort of protect and take care of. And that's not, that's not a good thing for the kid. It almost seems like what we were talking about before is he's raising his bar to meet the level of expectation that other people are placing on him. And that, that's awesome. You know, that he that's has, right. that they're placing, they're saying, hey, we may cap him here. That's right. But no. That's right. He's here. And we're going to set it there and he's going to go to that point. That's because right. we're, we're telling him it's possible. That's right. And so if I have any wisdom, is my wisdom comes from putting the right people in place who can do that for him. So I don't put him around people who expect nothing of him. I don't put him around people who speak language of low functioning. I don't, I don't want him around that because I understand the self-fulfilling prophecy. I also have the self-reflection to know that that person who is going to challenge him and, and really push him, it's not me. So I step away. And I'm not his physical therapist. I'm not his occupational therapist. I'm not his speech therapist. I'm his mother. And I am so grateful to the people around him who will challenge him to meet his potential because I'm not the best person for that. But coming back to that is like, at least I recognize that. And I, I recognize that he's better off not being with me all day long. It's not good for him to be with me all day long because I don't ask him to do anything for himself. And, and on a certain level, I think all mothers have to learn how to back up, right? Because mothers do for kids. And mothers might keep kids in a state of perpetual adolescence because they are continuing to do. But the nature of mom is to do for kids. It, I, I'm sure that this woman, I'm talking about her a lot with regard to the kid who she got into school, I, I, I'm sure that she thought she was doing for her kid. She was, she was carving out the niche for her kid to have a successful life. I wonder I, if she was doing for a kid or doing for herself. Maybe, you know, maybe you, know yeah. you don't know, right? She wants to say that her kid goes to the school. She wants to use her kid in that kind of way. I, I don't know, right? But um, the recognition that comes from how, and it's, I think it's a really tough question. Like, you know, what is serving the kids? And we can ask that question um, as parents, we could ask it as educators, what is serving the kids? And then we make choices that raise them. You know, we say we raise children, right? That means we lift them up. We don't keep them in the same level. And we certainly, as I oftentimes see within what we do, we don't beat them down. No, I think uh, on that note, we're an hour in. Oh, we are. We are. All right. So uh, just to recap, we talked about the process, 
Um, the next one, I want to continue talking about the process, but also talk about the resistance that happens in the process. And that, to me, the resistance is that voice that tells you to quit and how to overcome that voice as part of the process, because I think there's so much in there and that it's always easier. Our reptilian brain is always looking for the easiest out. And in work, our work, there's so, always so many, especially now with distractions, phones, all those things. How do we block those out? How do we overcome the resistance as part of the process to get to where we want to go? And this was awesome. So thank you for doing this with me. Thank you. It was fun.